Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I'm Vered Kogan, and I am delighted to introduce you to Dave Perro. Dave is the two-time Guinness record holder for greatest memory, as well as the CEO of Faro Memory and Faro Communications. He's been featured as a guest speaker on over 2,000 interviews in the media, including the Today Show, Live with Regis and Kelly, Steve Harvey, Discovery Channel, and many others. To earn the world record, Faro recalled the exact order of 59 decks of shuffled playing cards using the Faro Memory Method. This method was originally invented to combat Pharaoh's dys- dys- dyslexia and ADHD and is now a unique memory system backed by a double-blind neuroscience study at McGill University. Super cool. He is also the author of Brain Hacker, Master Memory, Focus Emotions, and more to unleash the genius within. Welcome, Dave. It is such a treat to have you here today talking about such an important topic. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So let's get right into it. So your book is called Brain Hacker. What are some of the really cool brain hacks that you may be able to offer to our listeners today to help them, whether it is with their memory, with their focus, with their emotions and more? Uh, The biggest question people have when they hear I'm in the Guinness Book of Records is they think I was somehow born with this, that, uh, uh, you know, I'm some sort of uh, savant. And uh, that's the first thing I want to dispel. Uh, what you don't know is that I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia when I was in high school, um, grade nine, in fact, so it's kind of late by today's standards, but this was, I'm, I'm, I'm older than I look. So it was early days of, of ADHD. And the system was really terrible at handling this. Uh, some people, you know, I, I definitely have criticisms about today, but in those days it was, it was, um, it was terrible. It was kind of a, a, a label that just kind of uh, caused the teachers to treat me differently and, and didn't really help me. Um, so I realized that if I was going to make something in my life, I had to take charge of my brain and it became an obsession. And I don't know if you've ever been obsessed about something, but it turns out I'm actually, I actually end up, I have a very high IQ. I'm a very smart guy. I just had to overcome, you know, these issues and it kind of unleashed that power. So tell us a little bit of of that journey, because I imagine that people listening that might have some of their own learning limitations or what is perceived as that, um, or maybe know uh, of others, maybe their children or others that are struggling. So what can you... Yeah, what can yeah, my son actually just came home from school and, and uh, you know, he was struggling with focus issues just the other day. And the same techniques that that I've taught for, you know, the better part of 20 years still still work to this day. So um, let me give you a couple of strategies, because when people think of a brain hack, there's a certain percentage of the population that just doesn't it doesn't compute. It's like, wait a second, how, how can I am I going to go in there with tools and try to change my brain? And what you don't realize is that your brain changes all the time. Every time you do something, you're telling your brain that that's something that's important to you. And it starts to wire itself towards that action. Anything you do consistently on a regular basis starts to become more of a habit. And you'll find that once you start to develop these habits, it's almost more impossible to get rid of those habits than it was to get started in the first place. That's actually a brain hack based on a principle called brain plasticity. But there's thousands of other little things about the brain that you didn't know. So number one, uh, this is one of my favorite ones. If you ever are blanking out, has has anyone ever asked you something, uh, Varid, where you know know the answer, it's on the tip of your tongue and you can't quite remember it? Yep. what was that celebrity in that movie? Now we have Google. Now we have now we have like these magic rectangles that we can ask everything. But back in the day, we would just have to blank out. And by the way, these things are making us dumb. By the way, smartphones make us dumb. Uh, they uh, they uh, by by not exercising your memory, it's actually starting to deteriorate as a people. But that's a completely other story. So next time you're blanking out. One of the things you can do that's very natural is to look up. And this is actually the opposite to what most people do. Most people look down because they get stressed out. When you get stressed out, you look down to talk to yourself. Think about last time you were stressed out. You're like, oh, where where, am I going to pay the bills? Oh, what does that person think about me? Uh, What do they say on Twitter? And you're looking down because you're talking to yourself, trying to talk yourself out of it. That's what people do when they look down. But when you look up, you actually send more electricity to the top part of your brain, your cerebral cortex, the higher level brain functions, and it improves your memory dramatically. And and this is natural, right? Have you ever been asked like for directions or you ask somebody for directions and they stop and go, oh, let me think. Okay, (laughs) 
it's like it's down there it's to the right and they're they're staring at the sky the whole time why do we do that that's our natural state but we get stressed out in our society we get stressed out looking at our phones we start looking down to talk ourselves out of that stress and we end up being more forgetful than ever before so this will improve your memory about 30 percent of the time when it's a stress-related mental block so give that a try super cool awesome what else you got? That's awesome. Oh, well, well I, I'm just branching, branching out from there. That's actually in, in like the very first few pages of the, of, of the book. Um, you know, branching out from there is how we use our body. Uh, one of the biggest things that people don't realize is that your, cog- your brain follows your body and your body follows your brain. So what I mean by that is your, your cognitive ability is very sensitive to what you do to your body. So have you ever, uh, and I'm not talking about self-destructive tactics, it's actually even more simple than that. Um, think of a time maybe you were studying, you know, maybe you're trying to answer a bunch of emails or you're just, you're just working, right? And you're exhausted, right? You just, you just want to go to sleep for four hours and you're tired, but you're not tired because you didn't get enough sleep. Uh, you could get full amount of sleep. And, and that's not actually the reason why you're tired. You're tired because of a buildup of different brain chemistry. Now, there's actually been some research on this over the years, and some of the opinions have changed as to why it happens. But um, a large factor is the buildup of serotonin in the brain. And what happens, and there's a bunch of other factors, but I, it, I, I'm not going to get into a complex neuroscience conversation. Let's just like simplify it, that when we do any sort of cognitive activity, what we're doing is we're burning up all the good chemistry that is, you know, your more epinephrine, you know, like otherwise known as adrenaline, um, you know, your everything that helps you focus and pay attention, you know, there's dopamine, things like that involved. And it starts to build up these byproducts like serotonin and other things, which generally are released when we're trying to fall asleep. And for a long time, we didn't really understand why that was. And the, the, the simple fact is your brain um, it's really best to be thought of as your brain as kind of like part of part hunter gatherer. You know, it's not meant to be sitting in a cubicle for eight hours a day or studying for four hours or something. Anytime you do that, your brain chemistry goes so far out of whack. That's a technical term, out of whack, um, that uh, that that essentially uh, there's kind of this this process where where it can't continue on. And the reason for that, and this is something that neuroscientists anecdotally say all the time, your brain is the most powerful computer that happens to have the worst battery imaginable. So our brain is really, really good at some brilliant moments, but it's not really good at trying to stretch those moments for hours and hours and hours. So what you do is you end up getting tired. So the hack for this is to move your body, literally standing up, walking around, doing a few jumping jacks or pushups, whatever you want to do, uh, that'll actually burn up all the serotonin and do a bunch of other neurochemical things that make you feel awake again. And the weird thing is that's the last thing we feel like doing, isn't it? When we're sitting there and we've just studying for a long time or reading for a long time, we're exhausted. The last thing you want to do is stand up. So just force yourself to do it. Stand up, walk around for a few minutes, and you'll find that your energy comes back. You start feeling better. And it's all brain chemistry that just kind of makes you feel that way. And this also accounts for a lot of moods. So a lot of times where people are moody, emotional, just go out, go for a walk, go outside, go for a walk and come back. I used to say this in, in my in my office uh, that, you know, right around noon, I had two or three employees that would just go for a walk for 10 minutes and come back. And they were incredibly productive after that. And it's just, you need to give yourself that, that your brain's ability to reset itself because that brain chemistry, that battery is not that good. It's got to recharge. Yeah, this is so important for people to hear because it's, in some ways it's well known. And at the same time, we forget because as you said, when we're stressed out, we get very focused and yeah. uh, we we kind of forget the, the, we do the wrong things, things we can do. We, yeah. Almost to a person, we do all the wrong things. Now, all I've done is, is give you just a couple of tips, but I'm trying to give you the reason behind it so that you can also think, oh, maybe that's the reason why you know, I'm not sleeping at night because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not engaging my brain as I go to bed or maybe that, you know, so I try to give kind of the ideas and the reasons behind these things so people understand it and they can actually make their own brain hacks over time. Yeah. And, and that's the essence of empowerment. And, you know, I speak so, to people that sometimes share and, and I myself sometimes struggle with this, you know, forgetfulness, like you said, I might see somebody and like forget their name and it takes me a few seconds to kind of get it back. And so what, what can we do to kind of overcome that casual? Oh, we've got a great one for that. Yeah, no. So the forgetfulness for names is a big one. I'm actually making a YouTube video about this. So uh, when it comes to names and faces, first off, uh, again, we have a hunter-gatherer brain. 
You know, we don't have a sophisticated civilized brain. We have a brain that's built for the jungle, right? So when you're counting another, another human being, what's one of the first things you do? You know, the, that old age old handshake? Well, you do the handshake that, that, that traditionally was to show you don't have a weapon in your hand. You know, the, the, the bow is actually for a similar reason because your hands are at the side uh, in other cultures. So um, if you think about it, your brain's kind of pre-programmed and ready to evaluate somebody as like friend or foe right when you first meet them. And you've got all these different things. And even if you know they're not in that friend or foe mode, let's be honest, you go to, you go to a club or you go to a, a, a party or something, you're evaluating to see if they're better than you or if they, uh, you know, they can teach you something or maybe you're going to learn from them or, or something like that. You know, um, and your ego gets involved and all of these different things are happening when you're looking at them. You're paying attention to everything that you're looking at. You're just not paying attention to anything they say. Their name is just not a priority. So a little hack for that is, and this is something that you got to develop a habit for. So every day, and I suggest people like write it on a card, put it beside their bed. They carry that card with them everywhere they go. Um, and I used to print these up for, for my students. But basically, you just write on the card, what was their, what was their name? Question mark. So it's the, it's the idea, oh, what was their name? What was their name? What is their name? Right? That question gets your brain awake, goes, oh my God, I forgot something. I got to remember that person's name. And what I would do is I would tell my students, put it on a card, put it in your pocket. Every time you touch that card, you'll be reminded to, to ask that name. And you look around at a few people and go, oh, I wonder what their name is. Oh, I wonder what that person's name is. I wonder what their name is. And so the point is you're forcing yourself artificially to ask yourself this question, let's say like five to 10 to 20 times a day for about a week. After a week, you'll find that once you meet somebody for the first time and they say their name, your brain will wake up and go, oh, well, that's that's something I got to pay attention to. That's really important because you've trained your brain to focus on the name. And, you know, how about for those of us that do study for exams or certifications or anything like that, or maybe have kids that need to study for tests, memorization tests, what can we do to get better results or to support our kiddos to get even better results? Um, so what can we do for our kids? Helping kids is, is super, super important. Um, my, my little one has been, has been struggling a lot. Uh, he really, uh, COVID was tough on him and he's kind of getting back into, into, uh, studying and, uh, you know, we're trying all the different strategies and, and some of them work, some of them don't. So, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of like persistence, of course. And I say that because I want to make it clear that I'm not I'm not perfect and not everything I try is just suddenly works out and everything. There's a lot of trial and error and any parent out there, um, I'm a parent myself. I know exactly what you're going through. So when I give you a strategy or solution, uh, uh, take it with a grain of salt, realize it's not going to work for everybody. You got to try several things. But some of the things that really do work, especially for attention issues, is uh, chopping up tasks into tiny chunks. And avoiding the reward principle. So there's there's two two things that I said there. So the first one is you take some big task like like uh, like reading a reading an amazing book maybe you know you want to read a wonderful book uh, you know obviously it's chop, it's chopped up into chapters right and let's say you're a terrible reader you just can't seem to get yourself to read you haven't read a book in years or something I would say hey do a page a day. Just just stick to a page a day and do a little tiny task, and then you'll get you'll build up that momentum of, to the point where a page is nothing, and you build up more and more and more. Especially with young ones, my my son's uh, eight years old. We did that with math. It was very resistant to math, so instead of like pushing him through a ton in one day, we focused on something he was good at and did a little bit every single day, even if it was even on a Saturday or a Sunday or something. And now math is one of his best subjects. So that's that's something else that helps you build up a tolerance. The other thing to keep in mind when it comes to focus, remember our brains have bad batteries, uh, a technique that I developed called focus bursts. And essentially, this is like interval training with the brain. It allowed me to get my Guinness record, by the way, uh, instead of trying to learn everything all at once. So in my case, I was memorizing 3068 cards in a, in a row, all shuffled together. Like it's a it's an insane task, like no human being should ever want to do this. Um, so to do that though how do you do it it's like it's like eating an elephant like one bite at a time right so i couldn't just kind of memorize all the way through i would my focus would 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 go into the toilet so what i did was i focused for uh it, it was it was essentially uh 6 minute bursts of energy so i do 6 minutes incredibly intensely uh i would actually go through um uh usually about two decks in 6 minutes and then later on i was just like one deck at 6 minutes and sometimes i was a half a deck at 6 minutes if i was really struggling so i didn't have a set amount 
but I would do six minutes on and then six minutes off. And what that would do is it would allow my brain chemistry time to rebalance. And then I would go back at the task fresh. And we saw the, we found this time and time again. Um, I codified it into a system called Focus First. And we have like a, a, a protocol you follow and a way to apply it to different curriculums and things like that. But you no, know, this is this has been done in in other areas. You know, like when you're teaching, um, there's there's a study done with lions when they were teaching them tricks and dogs as well. That uh, the ones they were teaching, if they had short breaks in between each lesson, they actually learned faster than the ones that were just taught all the way through. And you'd think more instruction is better, but it's not the case. Your brain needs time to process that instruction because it, again, it doesn't matter what somebody teaches you; it matters what you learn, right? Uh, the other thing I want to say, can I give you another one, by the way? I don't want to. Please, you're awesome. All right. Um, another one, actually, that you want to avoid is the reward principle. This one blew my mind, but it's absolutely true. And it affected me a lot. I, I used rewards for the longest time. And I was wondering why I was procrastinating so much. So I used the focus burst and it would help with my procrastination because I'd chop up my tasks into tiny little chunks. But um what I actually, uh, I actually have, have Huberman to thank. He's a famous neuroscientist that has a podcast that kind of led me down this rabbit hole of looking into the reward centers of the brain. And the, the really fascinating part that we know now is that if you reward somebody, especially for a behavior that they somewhat enjoy, they will start to dislike it. And it has to do with a whole complex series of things about how dopamine is released. A lot of people think dopamine is the reward center, um, but it's not exactly. It's like, that's our interpretation. That's our human view of things saying dopamine release is a reward for something. But in reality, it actually is more like an excitable state, you know? And if you can get that excitable state during the action itself, this is my term, excitable state. I don't, other people would describe it differently, but based on the research, this is, this is the way I would, I would, I would describe it. If you can get that excitable state while you're doing the work, then you'll have motivation that'll last. Mm -hmm. If you are only going to get that excitable state after the work is over, you're not associating that to the work itself and you get diminishing returns when you do the work. So this is where you get someone who just loves math so damn much. They, you know, they, they become a mathematician and they, you know, they get a, a, an award for it or me memorizing that. I, I realized like earlier on in my career, yeah, when I was obsessed with memory, I was getting the reward from the activity itself. I was, I was enjoying it and enjoying the challenge of it, by the way, like you can, you can do something difficult, even painful. And that can be your reward because there's a part of your brain that, re, that, that feels a sense of accomplishment by doing difficult things. You know, like there's, there's people who felt a sense of reward from surviving torture, even, you know, to use an extreme example. So uh, our brain is capable of doing that. So you don't just have to have the carrot and the stick or, you know, the cookie at the end of, of the meal to reward you for the meal, you can get your joy from the meal itself. And if you do, that looks like that's bulletproof motivation that'll last forever. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. And, and I'm a fan of uh, Huberman lab as well. And I remember he's saying in situations like this to tell ourselves, right, I'm choosing to do this to communicate with our brain, essentially, right, I'm mm -hmm. even though this is hard, I'm choosing to do this. And that yeah. helps us to kind of stick with it. So yeah, that could be that doesn't even have to be so like very woo woo, like, oh, I am choosing to it, it can be just like, no, I signed up for this. This is what I got to do. You know, like think of it like like, hey, this is what this is. This is what it takes. If I want to do it, let's go for it. You know, and, and then all of a sudden you get this this pride that comes from actually accomplishing it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I know that you also work with with businesses to help them to. Uh, with some memory techniques, again, to be able to attract more sales, to be able to enhance their marketing. So for those people out there who uh, want to uh, improve their business in some way or, you know, support if they're an employee to support the, the business owner, what what can they do? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, basically, I, I really enjoy my my uh, career as a memory expert, but I wanted to branch out and I was very, very good at getting publicity. I've been on over 2000 interviews, everything from Dr. Oz several times to the Today Show, CNN, I was in the New York Times. All of this stuff happened because of uh, how I solicited media attention for my business. So, um, and that led to about 100,000 copies of my previous books being sold and about 10 million in sales and an infomercial and some, some great stuff. So when you do that, 
and you start with nothing. Uh, rightfully so. A lot of entrepreneurs come up to you. They they want to know how you do the uh, how you do the PR. How do you get on the Today Show? How does something like that happen? And I realized that I was really good at it, so I got into that. Started an agency, but I couldn't help but be the memory guy anymore. And as I was training my staff, I was as I was, as we were working out how we could actually get the media's attention, I realized that marketing is a memory technique. I mean, every advertiser wants you to remember their product. You wouldn't believe how many times there's subconscious subliminal messages that may or may not work in there. There's a lot of experimentation on there. But I can tell you there is a science uh, and a neuroscience behind uh, this marketing. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, I'll give you a couple of things that just about anybody who's in business can use right now. Uh, and it's kind of a psychological thing, but it works really well. So first off, when it comes to memory, uh, the person who can recall product features and information off the top of their head that is an, an expert uh, will get the sale more often than not. We know that. But th th there's actually a really interesting diminishing return. There was this study done with this large uh, appliance store and people would come in for appliances. Now, typically people come in, they have a need, like you don't just shop for appliances, like the damn thing broke or you're renovating or something, right? So everybody is a potential sale. They they would, you know, round robin these off to different salespeople and they found that one was outperforming everybody else and they're trying to figure out why, of course, right? And that's the age old thing. Well, they found out in this case that one person always had an answer off the top of their head. Uh, they very, they, they either knew the information or they knew something like it. And as long as they could do the answer off the top of their head, then they uh, they were able to go all the way to the end of the sale. Um, the others who had to look up information, they had to look it up in the catalog. Uh, every time they had to look something up, it cut their chances of making that sale in half. You know, so think about that. It's like, you know, does this thing have uh, this special feature that I like? And and, you know, the one guy had an answer. He said, well, you know, all of all of these brands have that feature. So it should have that feature. That's still a valid answer, right? You know, even if you don't know 100%, but the other goes, I don't know, I'm going to go look it up. Then they had time to go, oh, maybe this person we're dealing with isn't as knowledgeable as we think. That, that applies to every industry that applies to your job. If you want to keep your job or get promoted, if you know the answers off the top of your head, if you are knowledgeable about your industry, then you're likely you're more likely to get that promotion. Here's a, there's a simple memory technique, actually, it's in the book, of course, um, and it's called the room method. It's the simplest of all the memory techniques. So if you want to remember a list of items, let's say it's like a grocery list or something, right? Pick a room that you know, like this room, and mentally place the items around the room. Like just looking in my background, I would I would place something like on on the on the fireplace there, by by the birch tree, by the little hand there, by the TV. I've got like 20 different places I could I could place something. You mentally place things around the room. That's how you can remember a list of 20, 30 objects. I've done that trick a thousand times. You guys can go on my YouTube channel, you see a few examples of it, for example. Um, so the way we can do this with product information and one of the best ways to impress customers is to be able to have a few of these lists off the top of your head. So if you're nervous, you, you obviously can't predict every question they're going to ask. But if you've been doing this business for, you know, over a year or something, you probably know most of the common questions. And if you can come up with a very impressive answer to those common questions, it basically you pass the test. They're not trying to test you anymore to see if you know your stuff, you know. So, I mean, I, I give an example like I had uh, real estate agents that would use my memory techniques, for example, before they would go to a house, they would have uh, 10 different points about the house. And they would, instead of looking at a sheet, they would they would memorize it using the techniques. And then when they were talking to the potential people walking through the house, they would say, well, it's this close to the nearest school. It's this close to the nearest hospital. It has this property taxes. It has this, you know, this roof was, you know, two years old and da 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 da, da just off the top of there. And, and people constantly commented that they're like, oh, you really know your stuff. And that's when the loyalty came, they, you know, whether or not they went with that house or not, there are very often they stayed with that real estate agent because that's how you impress them. So come right out of the gate with like 10 points of things that that you want them to know and then they'll think there's there's a large iceberg behind it i'm not trying to say hey that should be the only thing you know about your industry please be knowledgeable about your industry if you're you know purporting to be that don't be fake but that's a good way that you can impress people so that they stop you know they don't test you they trust your knowledge so just to make sure i understand so we we let's say they prepare that list of facts right or answers to 10 questions or objections and then can you clarify kind of around what you would do around the room? How how would you connect that to to the room? Yeah, okay. So so there would be um 
this gets into some of the other uh, techniques like uh, it takes a while to teach the technique for like numbers, for example, and, and, and technical terms. But uh, essentially, each one of these bullet points or items, you would come up with some sort of object. Right. So um, I'll just say uh, probably the simplest way I could do is I've had a number of people who were car salespeople that that were able to do this. So they memorized features like power door locks, power windows, uh, onboard GPS, things like that. All these things you can visualize. Right. The other stuff like the number of miles to the nearest school that that takes an extra technique. I'd have to teach you to memorize numbers. Once you know the, the technique for numbers, you can memorize thousands of digits of pi if you want to. But it just takes a little longer. So anyways, so uh, what they would do is they you'd take a room like this, or you take the car in their case that they wanted to memorize different features at, and they would start from right to left. They would start from like the, the sorry, the left to right, just like you would read so the left front you know, bumper or something. They would put something that would re represent a power door lock. So they imagine like a giant, uh, giant master lock, you know, going kunk, right out there, like, like going right through the car, you know, something really like cartoonish, right? You know, and then and then you know, power windows. You'd imagine like windows shooting out of the the right side of the car, like just kind of exaggerate it. And you would do this with all the different features, you know, down down the line. Obviously, now power windows and power door locks are 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 very common, so that's a bad example. But I'm talking about I've been teaching this for like ten years, so they weren't so common then. Um, but uh, now it would be you know hybrid or EV capable or or you know the distance you can travel, things like that. But you would take these and you turn each point into something you can visualize and you place it around the room or around the vehicle or around the product that you're trying to uh, trying to link it to. And it really does work. Uh, you you visualize that in your mind's eye. You don't even have to be in front of it. And you'll remember that, you know, the, the left front bumper had this giant lock on it, you know, and the right front bumper had glass shooting out of it. And so these silly things, when it's done in the right way, can actually trick the brain into remembering for days, weeks, months, even years. Yeah, that's super cool. I remember when my daughters were young and they were kind of learning, you know, for grammar tests or uh, spelling tests, excuse me, you know, like you'd have to kind of remember how to spell things and uh, or remembering definitions to things and that they would create stories yeah. out of, you know, out of that or images. Yeah. And the problem is, is I, I wish people taught this more formally, because when you start to do that, if you don't have all the training, then you can do it for a couple of situations, then you'll get stuck. Right. But uh, we've over the years, I've figured out how to handle any any type of technical term. Like I did this to memorize a thousand words of of Thai and Cantonese on a bet once. Um, we did it for uh, for memorizing. Uh, I helped uh, physics students memorize three hundred different formulas um, and big you know big things. Um, another thing in sales and marketing that people don't think about um, is actually how referrals happen. So uh, one of the interesting things about that is when people get referrals, we think it's because people love us. And occasionally that might be the case. But the majority of time referrals actually come from the mental state of fear or, or um, concern. And what I mean by that is uh, the real estate agent that gets a referral to a friend of theirs, but it's because you care about your friend that you're referring to them and you don't want them to be taken advantage of by another real estate agent. And we know this actually because one of the most referred industries in the world is car mechanics. Mm -hmm. And car mechanics are not known for being the most ethical, right? I mean, how many times have there been, you know, hidden camera episodes, ABC, this and that, where you went into the mechanic and they, you know, broke something just so they could be paid to fix it and everything. I'm not suggesting all car mechanics are like this, but there's this perception that there's a lot of people out there to take advantage. So as a result, there's more referrals. They get more of their business for, through referrals than nearly any other industry. So it's precisely because people are nervous and afraid of the industry that they're getting those referrals. So that's the psychological position. And this is a brain hack because this is getting inside the mind of the customer. This is kind of some of the things that we do for, for companies and such when we're talking about uh, marketing is we want to know what the customer is thinking so we can, you know, we can better serve them. So um, simply put, uh, by asking the customer, uh, essentially, if I were to ask you, hey, do you have any referrals? You know, you'd be like, uh, no, because you're blanking out. So understanding how your mind retrieves information, that's a brain hack. And that actually would be very profitable to me if I could find the right way to ask the question. Well, the right way to ask the question is to ask you about your family, ask you about, you know, your background, you know, people, different people to know. Pretty soon we're talking about 50 different people. And if uh, now I, 
I might, because I authors and, and experts in small businesses are my main biz, are my main source for my agency. I might ask you a bunch of professional life. Hey, who do you know who you're connected to? Tell me about some of your stories. Where have you been? Then when you're thinking about all those people, you know, what you want to do is, is ask them a question. Uh, if any of them have ever been interested in publicity, which is one of the things that we do or marketing, um, I would be happy to give them a free consultation because you don't want them just like going on YouTube and getting all this misinformation. A line like that has, wor it has worked really well. It's not fear mongering, but letting people know the difference between talking to an expert and just kind of gathering maybe misinformation on the internet. When participants were reminded of that, then uh, referrals went up dramatically because all of a sudden, by giving me a referral, you're rescuing your friend from a potential dangerous misinformation situation rather than putting them in a position that would be harmful. What would people need to do in order to get more referrals? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a simple situation. We did this with real estate agents, and that's a, that's an industry everybody understands. So um, they would sit down with a new potential client and get to know them. Uh, you really do have to take your time, build a relationship, and get to know them. And, and pretty soon you're talking about – so you start talking to them about anybody who is uh, renting right now or anybody who's looking to, to get into real estate, anyone to buy a house. The first answer you'll get is, no, 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 we don't know anybody, right, because that's the defensive response. But when you start talking about – where do you come from? How long you been here? Do you have any, you know, what were your parents, grandparents, you know, uh, how are your kids? Uh, are they, did they leave the house and everything? Pretty soon you start hearing about somebody who had a major life change. This was, this was one of the things for real estate people. So a life change is like somebody just got married or somebody just had a child or perhaps somebody just retired. Those are some of the big reasons to buy a house. And, and, you know, then the real estate agent would pipe up and say, well, you know, um, that person who just had a child, they're, they're probably considering getting out of that apartment. At least they want to. And they might not realize how easy it is to get into a house nowadays. I'd love to talk to them about it and, and you know, share my, you know, share my knowledge because, you know, and then and then you could say, you know, because like their only other option right now is to probably go on the Internet. And you never know what they're going to hear, you know. So all of a sudden, by doing that, it, it gave the uh, the real estate agent the position of expertise, which is what they what they wanted to have. And and yeah, they did get a lot of referrals. Every one of those little coffee sessions, they get several names, which would lead to more and more business. It was like this instead of the roller coaster of sales, it was like this constant, uh, you know, business from your current clientele. So that was one thing that I was doing in real estate that 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 applied kind of that understanding of how the brain recalls information to the art of, of, uh, of referrals. I think it's great. I think anytime that we go in kind of, like you said, genuinely wanting to understand people to get to know them and, and to help, right. Whoever we can help mm -hmm. with our services, I think it's a great thing. So I appreciate that you shared that. And this could also be applied in the job search world where you ask, you know, Hey, do you know anyone who's hiring in this industry? And people are right. like, oh, I don't know, but if we can help them help us, yeah. Um, then, of course, people want to help and uh, people want their friends and family, of course, in the case of real estate agents, you know, to get good service. So I'm so grateful to you, Dave, for being here today, sharing so many helpful little hacks, little tips, because they really can make a difference. And I know that there's loads more in your book. So can you share with us how can people get the book um, and connect with you? Yeah, sure. Well, um, it's uh, uh, I should pull the right side up here. Uh, Brain Hacker. Um, it's on Amazon right now. You can uh, pre-order, uh, and uh, you can also just type into Google my name, Faro, Dave Faro, uh, if you want to see Faro Communications. Uh, and yeah, and also if uh, anybody is interested in PR services, my company, uh, Faro Communications, we do uh, free consultations. So I could talk to you uh, if you book a, a consult on our website. Um, and uh, we're going to have some uh, courses coming out soon for, uh, for all of this. So please uh, stay tuned. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. I really congratulate you on the amazing achievements that you've had being able to go from ADHD and dyslexia to the incredible uh, milestones that you've done. It's certainly inspiring for me and I'm sure for many, many others um, and for all the people that you've gotten to help as a result of that. So thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it.